So welcome to this evening's BMS talk. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our chair for the talk this evening, and that's Janet Quinn. Um, Jan is currently General Secretary of the BMS, but for her day job, she's Professor of Eukaryotic Microbiology at Newcastle University. Jan's research focus is on human fungal pathogens, in particular, the stress signaling mechanisms by which such pathogens survive post-imposed stresses. So thank you very much, Jan, for chairing and over to you. OK, thank you very much. Um, OK, welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for finding the time to come and hear to this, what I'm sure will be an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, who is Elaine Bignall. So Elaine, as I'm sure most of you know, is the current president of the BMS. And I think this is a really excellent way that we can all learn more about the excellent research that Elaine is currently undertaking. So Elaine is Professor of Medical Mycology um, and co-director for the MRC Centre for Medical Mycology based at the University of Exeter. She also is the UK Director of the Centre for Medical Mycology in Latin America, and she became the elected Fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology very recently. I met Elaine many, many years ago for the first time when Elaine was based at Imperial College London, working with Ken Haynes. And she had an interest in pH sensing then. And the first time I met Elaine, she was undertaking this absolutely massive genetic screen looking for pH sensitive mutants. And I was impressed then, and I continue to be impressed and follow Elaine's absolutely stellar career in medical mycology. And I'm absolutely delighted that she's now the president of our society. So just to give you a bit of feel for what Elaine works on. So her work addresses the mechanistic basis of lung diseases caused by this major mold pathogen of humans, Aspergillus fumigatus. Her main interests, as I've alluded to, are pH sensing and pathogenicity. Um, she's also interested in transcriptional regulation of host adaptation and the mechanistic basis of tissue invasion during invasive fungal disease. So in this talk, Elaine is going to talk to us about this work, um, about how this work is leading to the development of novel antifungal therapies, which we are in dire need of, as well as the challenges of defining pathogenicity in Aspergillus fumigatus, which is ordinarily a common environmental mode. So Elaine's title of the talk is Understanding a Mold that Infects Human mm -hmm. Lungs. So welcome, Elaine. Um, before, I, before I let you get started, can I just um, ask the audience that if you have any questions, we will ask these after Elaine's finished her presentation, but if you could pop them in the chat, that would be great. Um, and that's it. So that's all the housekeeping. So Elaine, over to you and welcome. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, and good evening, everyone. Um, also, thanks to Sally and Emma for organising this event. Um, yeah, so um, this talk will address the biology of a saprotrophic soil dwelling mould called Aspergillus fumigatus. Uh, and this organism is abundant in the natural environment, but it's also capable of infecting the human host. Um, and primarily this evening, uh, I'm going to focus upon some ongoing work that seeks to understand the modus operandi, if you like, of this pathogen in the infection setting, um, and also how we are using the knowledge that we can derive from our research to try to design new therapies. Um, and this is a name that we often uh, pay lip service to when we're applying for research funding. Um, but uh, we have a vested interest in building a toolkit that may be able to um, um, allow us to exploit the biology um, that we're discovering along the way. So um, aspergillosis affect millions of people annually, and they cause a high burden of fatal disease. Um, and the severity of disease um, varies according to the underlying uh, host immune status. Um, so in healthy individuals, um, the immune, the innate immune response um, is an efficient mechanism for clearing inhaled aspergillus fumigator spores. But 
Um, in settings of dysfunctional um, immunity, either inherited, uh, induced by chemotherapy uh, or by other disease or infection, um, Aspergillus can colonize uh, and invade the respiratory tissues, uh, and this can sometimes be fatal. Um, and there are a range of risk factors that um, vary from um, severely immunocompromised hosts, these are patients who uh, are suffering from hematological malignancies, who've undergone organ transplant, who have uh, severe viral pneumonias. Uh, caused by influenza, and now we know also um, SARS-CoV-2, um, and or individuals who have chronic um, underlying lung diseases such as COPD, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, tuberculosis, uh, etc. And aspergillus can also cause um, allergic uh, type disease uh, in individuals who mount hypersensitivity type responses to uh, inhaled spores. Um, and overall, um, there are around uh, 3 million episodes per annum. These numbers are uh, under constant uh, debate and review, but it, they're actually quite difficult um, to diagnose um, these syndromes. Now, um, across the board, uh, clinical antifungal therapy is limited to a single class of antifungal drugs. Um, the azoles, and, and these are the only uh, orally uh, bioavailable drugs. But uh, in recent years, um, the dual use of azoles um, as agricultural and medicinal um, medicines and fungicides has uh, accelerated the emergence of clinical azole resistance. Um, and this is a problem because um, in the settings of both acute and chronic aspergillosis, these diseases can be rapidly fatal, particularly where infection with a drug resistant uh, aspergillus isolate uh, is concerned. So the World Health Organization has recently acknowledged the scale of this problem uh, and has highlighted a critical need to develop a uh, new novel mode of action uh, antifungal drugs for clinical use. So aspergillus fumigatus is a prolific producer of spores and these remain airborne for long periods of time. Um, human beings frequently inhale the spores uh, and they're usually uh, rapidly neutralized by host immune cells. Um, but as you can see here, uh, this organism is able to uh, germinate uh, and grow quite rapidly uh, at 37 degrees. Uh, and thermotolerance is a uh, a significant asset to this organism in terms of underpinning uh, its uh, pathogenic lifestyle. Um, and although this movie of growth in the lab resembles in terms of uh, appearance and perhaps the developmental features uh, of this fungus, resembles quite closely the type of morphology and invasive hyphae that we see in infected lung tissue, in fact, when the fungus infects the mammalian host, um, it's facing significant um, pressures and stresses that would not be experienced in the laboratory environment. So these uh, invading hyphae are constantly sensing and adapting to the tissue environment. Um, they are producing secreted enzymes and toxins that we know are important for uh, damaging host tissues and also subverting uh, the immune response. Uh, and this cocktail of noxious substances um, is very harmful to um, mammalian epithelial cells, both in the tissue environment uh, and uh, when cultured uh, in the laboratory setting. Um, but the, the, the secretome uh, and the constituents of the secretome um, are, are, are not... Um, consistent across different uh, environmental niches. Um, and this cocktail of secreted factors has to be very carefully tailored to the ambient environment of the growing hypha, in particular to the uh, ambient pH of the surrounding tissue that governs the electrochemical gradient um, across the cell membrane, um, against which all of the essential nutrients, transport of all of the essential nutrients will be balanced um, um, uh, allowing the absorption of nutrients um, and, and other um, electrolytes uh, and chemicals and toxins will be exported. 
So pH homeostasis is vital across all kingdoms of life. Um, in healthy humans, acid-base maintenance uh, exerts very tight control of systemic pH. Uh, and this must remain between 7.35 and 7.45, so within one pH unit. Um, and this pH is optimal for many biological processes, including the oxygenation of blood. And in the healthy lung, the airway lining fluid is mildly alkaline, but um, there is controlled acidification of the airway surface that takes place. Um, and this is thought to serve an antimicrobial purpose. Uh, and during airway inflammation, the activation of proton pumps acidifies the lumen of the airway, and so does the degranulation uh, of phagocytic immune cells uh, as they encounter and tackle um, um, pathogens uh, in this tissue environment. And acidification of the airway lining fluids can also have adverse effects. So it can promote mucus viscosity um, and plugging, and it can also um, decrease uh, ciliary action um, and it can promote airway inflammation and hyper-responsiveness. Uh, and we know that these uh, features are exacerbated by fungal disease. But there are also mechanisms to, um, to balance this. So there are mechanisms to alkalinize the uh, lumen as well. Um, and these uh, are dependent upon um, proteins um, such as albumin, um, also on bicarbonate secretion, um, which is regulated in part by the cystic fibrosis transmembrane um, conductance uh, regulator, uh, as well as the production of ammonia um, and bicarbonate by glutaminase. Now, fungi uh, have also evolved the means to exert strict control over um, cellular responses to pH flux. Um, and this is fundamentally important for fungi because um, particularly the, 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 micro, uh, the, the microscopic uh, organisms that cause human diseases are free living organisms. Um, and in contrast to the, the human environment where pH uh, control is maintained as a, a systemic uh, activity um, at the level of uh, whole organs and tissues, um, individual fungal cells must be able to sense um, and adapt uh, to external pH. And this is important because it uh, protects critical physiological aspects uh, of fungal cell biology, such as the cell wall biosynthesis. Um, so it's fundamentally important to promote viability of many fungal pathogens over a broad range of uh, pH conditions that they might experience in the host environment. Um, and this um, ability to control the production of secreted proteases and cell wall metabolic enzymes um, enables fungi to colonize and exploit niches that span really impressive ranges of extracellular pH, um, because failure to do so results in loss of viability uh, at those pHs. Um, and then as a whole, the intersection between the host and the fungal control of pH homeostasis has important functional significance in terms of the outcome of disease. Um, for example, systemic acidosis promotes fungal disease via elevated serum iron concentrations. Um, and um, this is a, a known risk factor um, for, for fungal infection. So how do fungi uh, maintain control uh, over um, the production uh, of all of these important metabolites and cell wall biosynthetic enzymes? Well, we've known for a long time um, that this regulatory control uh, is mediated by a genetic mechanism that is highly conserved across fungal species, not only in the organisms that cause uh, human and animal diseases, but also uh, in fungi that infect plants and insects. And um, at the core of this um, regulatory pathway is a transcription factor that's called PAC-C um, in the molds, RIM-101 uh, in, in uh, the yeast species. Um, and PAC-C is a transcription factor that ordinarily resides in the cytoplasm, um, of the fungal cell. Um, and um, the transcription factor becomes processed 
and cleaved um, in an enzymatic fashion in response to high pH. Uh, and this allows the transcription factor, the short form of the transcription factor to move into the nucleus of the cell um, where it's able to um, bind to the promoters of genes that are expressed at alkaline uh, and acid pHs. Um, and uh, depending upon the context of that gene promoter, um, the pH um, optimum uh, of the, the gene under PAXI regulation, um, that regulatory control may occur in a positive uh, or a negative fashion. PAXI uh, is processed in response to a signal that is perceived um, at the periphery of the cell. Um, in the case of Aspergillus species by a seven transmembrane domain protein called PALH um, that interacts with a, a cognate arrestin-like protein called PALF. Um, and at alkaline pH, um, PALH is absolutely required uh, in order to uh, activate PAXI mediated signaling uh, and expression of pH responsive genes. Um, and this system of regulation is absolutely critical for pH tolerance in aspergillae, for tissue invasion, the production of secreted proteases, uh, immunotoxins, uh, and pathogenesis. Um, so um, in early studies, um, before uh, the availability uh, of the pathogen genomes um, um, came online, um, we were working with model systems. And the data that I'm showing you here a data from a model ascomycete called Aspergillus nigellans. Um, and Aspergillus nigellans uh, has long been a workhorse uh, for um, fungal genetic studies. Um, and uh, in this panel uh, of images, I'm showing you the growth of a, a wild type uh, Aspergillus nigellans strain uh, over a, a, a wide range of pH uh, on buffered minimal media. Um, now, if you block pH signaling either by deleting the PAXI transcription factor um, or by uh, blocking the uh, pH sensory event, um, effectively uh, what happens is you prevent the ability uh, of the fungus to adapt to high pH. Um, and this is a useful phenotype for us to follow uh, in the laboratory. It's easy to measure and an excellent readout of uh, pathway functionality. In fact, it's only a very small part uh, of the physiological manifestation uh, of blocking pH signaling. Um, and it likely occurs as a result of cation toxicity at high pH. Um, because the detoxifying cation transporters are under PAXI regulatory control. So with this panel of mutant in, mutants in our early studies, uh, we were able to undertake uh, infections in mouse models of disease. If you immunosuppress mice, they are susceptible to infection, uh, even with fungal species that don't ordinarily cause infection. Uh, and what we found in this series of experiments was that if we deleted the PAXI transcription factor, um, we could um, significantly attenuate the pathogenicity uh, of a wild type Aspergillus nigellans strain. And this is a, a survival study uh, conducted in mice. Uh, and what you can see is that the, the wild type strain um, leads to a significant decrease in survival of the cohort. And this happens quite rapidly within a few days of infection. Whereas uh, an Aspergillus nigellans mutant that's unable to sense external uh, pH uh, is completely attenuated um, for virulence. Um, and um, via a series of experiments, we were able to demonstrate that the transcription factor is required for virulence, but also that it must be activated in response to uh, PAL mediated signaling. So in work that followed those early studies uh, over the next 15 years uh, or so, uh, possibly more, um, we spent a lot of time um, constructing uh, the mutants in uh, pathogenic uh, fungus, Aspergillus fumigatus, 
um, and undertaking uh, quite detailed analyses uh, of the particular phenotypic attributes of these mutants that could explain um, the deficits in pathogenicity. So uh, on the left-hand panel here, um, this is a piece of work that was undertaken by Margarita Bertuzzi and, and published in uh, 2014. Um, and this is an experiment where the uh, transcription factor to PAC-C was removed from Aspergillus fumigatus um, and um, we saw similar results uh, to those in the uh, Aspergillus nigellans uh, infection studies. So if you if you delete the pH responsive transcription factor, pathogenicity uh, uh, virulence is significantly attenuated. Um, and uh, this is set against a background of wild type um, or um, genetically reconstituted isolates. And the experiments conducted in, in two independent um, genetic backgrounds um, of Aspergillus fumigatus. Um, in these sections here, what we're looking at is the uh, tissue invasion by the fungus. So in these histology sections, the host tissue appears as green uh, and the, the fungal hyphae uh, are stained uh, here as black entities. And you could see them uh, invading the surrounding tissue in the case of a wild type infection on the left. And this is two days post-infection. Um, but in the case of a, a Paxinomita, Although those spores are germinating and beginning to uh, generate invasive hyphae, they're unable to penetrate um, through the, the airway. We were also able to undertake whole uh, genome transcriptome uh, analysis of the fungal transcriptome during host colonization in this model. Um, and uh, we undertook this analysis uh, in mice that had been subjected to various immunosuppressive regimens, including uh, steroid or uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy, both of which are important risk factors for Aspergillus disease. Um, and we were able to compare fungal gene expression in those mice models to fungal gene expression in the lab and show that there was a significantly different transcriptome in the host environment. Um, identifying effectively the pathogenic identity of this environmental mold, you'll recognize that there's a whole raft of genes that are upregulated during colonization of the mouse that uh, are not uh, upregulated uh, during laboratory culture. Uh, and on the right hand side here, um, this is the transcriptome of a, a Delta Pax e mutant, uh, where a whole section of those uh, genes. Um, are not upregulated. The vast majority of the genes that are under PAC-C regulatory control are um, encode gene products that uh, include signal peptides. So these are genes that encode gene products that are destined for activity um, at the periphery of the cell or outside of the fungal cell. Uh, and we also saw whole cell down regulation of the gliotoxin um, biosynthetic gene cluster. And gliotoxin is an important immunotoxin um, that damages um, lung cells uh, and also um, interferes with the migration uh, of immune cells uh, towards inflammatory foci in the lungs. <clears throat> so um, Joy uh, Ichioku during her PhD was able to demonstrate that um, if you culture human lung cells in the laboratory uh, and compare the damage caused by a pH non-sensing mutant to that of a parental isolate. The number of epithelial cells that are uh, detached uh, from the in vitro cell culture um, is far fewer in the case of a Paxi mutant. And this is true whether or not you challenge those uh, lung cells with a live fungal challenge in the case uh, of the green data here, or you take the culture filtrate uh, from um, a fungal culture uh, and expose that directly to uh, the epithelial cells. In fact, the fungal secretome is actually um, far more, more rapidly uh, toxic to the epithelial cells. Um, and this is measurable at the level of detachment from uh, the monolayer, but also um, the level of cytotoxicity, i.e. how much cell death do we see in human cells when we expose them um, to these different fungal isolates. Another important attribute of the pH non-signaling mutants um, was um, 
a heightened susceptibility to um, existing antifungal drugs. So in this panel, we're looking at the phenotype of Aspergillus hyphae from uh, two different genetic backgrounds. Um, in lab culture, in the absence or presence of a cell wall active uh, antifungal drug, Aspergillus uh, and what you'll appreciate here is that in both genetic backgrounds, the pH non-signaling isolate is far more susceptible to cell wall active drugs. Uh, and this is uh, manifesting as ballooning uh, of the hyphae. Um, and this effect was measurable both uh, in vitro, but also uh, in um, the, uh, the lung environment uh, of infected mice. Now, uh, an important um, caveat um, to point out uh, with these data when we're talking about mutants that lack the transcription factor um, is that PAC-C has such a broad regulatory domain. It regulates up and down regulates so many important genes that the loss of this gene in a null mutant also leads to a loss of fitness in the mutant. So one might argue that some of these phenotypes could simply be due to the fact that the Paxi null mutant is less fit. Importantly, however, mutants in gene products that lie upstream of the transcription factor, and these are data relating to the pH sensor, PALH, mutants that lack these upstream signaling components uh, do not suffer losses uh, in fitness. Um, and these are very nicely uh, exemplified, uh, these different phenotypes in the panel of assays that Margarita undertook, comparing the phenotypes of pH sensor mutants to the transcription factor mutants um, in two different isogenic strain sets generated uh, in two fumigators' genetic backgrounds. So um, what you can see in this data is laboratory culture at pH 5, pH 6.5, pH 7.2, pH 8. And you'll appreciate that high pH presents the stress even to a genetically intact fungal strain. Um, but at higher pH, particularly in the presence uh, of cations, this stress uh, becomes uh, uh, intolerable in the case of um, a pH sensor mutant um, to the extent where there's no growth at all uh, on these conditions uh, relative to um, um, acidic pH. Here is the Paxenol mutant, and you'll see that it's growing quite poorly across the panel of assays. So there's one mutant in one genetic background and there's the second. Um, so the, these phenotypes are consistent um, across uh, a raft of uh, different clinical and environmental isolates um, and consistent, however, with a, a loss of pH signaling, we still see that the, the pH sensing mutant is attenuated for virulence. So um, in this experiment, Again, a virulence test, we're looking at survival as an outcome of this experiment. In two different genetic backgrounds, a fungal strain that lacks the seven transmembrane domain PAL-H pH sensor is highly attenuated relative to wild type uh, and complemented isolates. Um, and as well as the uh, attenuation in virulence, we also see that there is an attenuation of damage caused uh, in uh, cultured epithelial cells, um, there's a significant reduction in tissue invasion in the lungs of the animals. On the left-hand side here, um, I'm showing you some readouts of PAXI processing. Um, and uh, in general, we measure this by detecting the, um, the low and high mobility forms of the transcription factor. So you'll remember that the transcription factor has to be proteolytically cleaved uh, in order to become uh, activated. Um, and in the case of the pH sensor mutants, delta pal H at both pH 5 uh, and pH 8, uh, what you'll appreciate is that there is a, a complete 
lack of the high mobility form of the protein. So um, the pH sensor is absolutely critical for promoting the processing of the transcription factor. Um, and, and also um, it's, it's a non-redundant uh, activator of PAC processing. Now, to complete this set of virulence assays, um, and particularly since the pH sensing mutant uh, is practically incapable of growth in the lung environment, Margarita undertook some additional experiments that asked whether or not in an established infection, if one were to knock down PAL-H expression, um, one would see protection uh, against disease. So in order to do this, she constructed a TET uh, regulatable allele on a plasmid that was introduced into Aspergillus fumigatus. Um, and when this allele is uh, expressed in a PAL-H null background, um, expression is responsive to the addition of a drug to the medium. So effectively, what it means is that we can switch on and off the expression uh, of the pH sensor by adding doxycycline to the growth medium. Um, so this panel just shows that the, um, the PAL-H uh, protein is expressed. It has an epitope tag that allows us to detect it by Western blot. It's expressed in the uh, absence of doxycycline, but when we add doxycycline to the growth medium, the expression of that uh, protein um, um, is prohibited. Um, and then um, concordant uh, with that result, what we can see is that the, um, um, the allele becomes, um, the, the, uh, the introduction of the mutant allele renders um, the fungal strain uh, highly sensitive to uh, alkaline pH um, when doxycycline is added to the medium. Um, so it's possible to add doxycycline to the drinking water um, of mice, uh, and this is the way in which we are able to knock down expression of the fungal gene um, once the infectious lesion has been established. Uh, and so in the bottom right-hand corner uh, of this slide, we're looking at data um, from uh, day three and day six of um, a lung infection. Um, and this documents the number of infectious lesions um, in the absence and presence of doxycycline. Uh, and so by day six, relative to um, an infection with a strain that um, has been uh, expressing PAL-H, um, the uh, repression uh, of expression of the pH sensor leads to around a 60% reduction in the number of infectious lesions in the lung. Um, so um, this was encouraging data, um, which suggested that the pH sensor could be um, a useful target um, for new antifungal drugs. Um, and of course, um, in terms of the likely drug ability uh, of uh, canonical seven transmembrane domain proteins. These types of proteins represent um, the most common uh, still uh, of druggable uh, proteins uh, across the entire spectrum uh, of uh, currently uh, approved uh, medicinal drugs. So interestingly, um, if you compare the pH sensing and signaling machinery uh, in various fungal pathogens, it becomes highly evident that evolution has delivered different solutions to this critical problem of sensing and appropriately adapting uh, to high pH. In the model uh, organism Saccharomyces cerevisiae, there are two seven transmembrane domain pH sensing proteins. RIM21 is the homologue for the Aspergillus PAL-H protein. Uh, and then there is a, a second protein, a non-homologous protein called DFG16. Um, these two proteins uh, serve non-redundant functions. So you have to have uh, both of these uh, 
proteins um, intact uh, and expressed in order for Saccharomyces to be able to sense uh, and adapt uh, to uh, alkaline pH. <clears throat> Again, in candida species, um, there are two putative pH sensors. Um, those go by the same name. In cryptococcus species, um, there are no um, homologous proteins uh, to RIM21 DFG16. Instead, uh, there is a, a semi transmembrane domain protein called RRA1, which is critically important um, for pH sensing and adaptation. Whereas in the Aspergillus species, um, there appears to be uh, only one seven transmembrane domain protein, uh, and that's PAL-H. So uh, other uh, interesting features uh, of this machinery um, are the ways in which the signal is transmitted. So in the case of Saccharomyces, Candida and Aspergillus, um, this is um, transmitted through a cognate arrestin, PALF, RIM8, RIM8. Um, and RIM8 is fundamental to transmission of the pH signal in these three species, but absent uh, in cryptococci. Other consistent findings are the involvement of the endocytic machinery. Um, so this is has differential relevance uh, according to species. In cryptococcus species, the endocytosis of the pH receptor, so the internalization of that protein uh, into the fungal cell, uh, is uh, critically important for functionality of the signaling mechanism. In candida species, in Saccharomyces, um, endocytosis uh, is likely to occur, but is more likely to be important for recycling of the receptor rather than functionality uh, of the signaling mechanism. And in Aspergillus species, um, the receptors uh, are not internalized. Instead, the pH um, sensing complex is assembled at the plasma membrane of the cell uh, and then components of the uh, escort signaling pathway are recruited to the cortex of the fungal cell, um, including um, PAL-A and PAL-B, which form a scaffold um, to uh, promote the protolytic cleavage of the transcription factor. So <clears throat> we wanted to understand more about the way in which the pH sensor PAL-H uh, was expressed, um, its stability uh, under various conditions and, and also um, aspects of its functionality. And we adopted a series of experiments that were based upon building a toolkit that would be important for downstream drug discovery studies. Most of these tools were based upon the plasmid that was used to deliver this um, tet responsive uh, allele of the pH sensor. So in all of the experiments that I'm gonna show you in the next four or five slides, we can add doxycycline to the experimental system to, um, um, to deplete uh, expression of the pH sensor. Now, because of the seven transmembrane domain nature of this protein, um, it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult to work with. Um, membrane proteins cannot be uh, easily uh, expressed and extracted um, from cells. They cannot be easily expressed uh, and um, crystallized uh, in order to uh, undertake structural studies. So there were various, um, reporter systems and tricks that we needed to um, set in place uh, in order to be able to understand more about the pH sensor. <clears throat> so um, this work was undertaken um, by Shadi Fahadi, uh, who was a PhD uh, student uh, in my lab um, in Manchester. She'll be defending her thesis uh, in a few weeks time. Um, and Shadi's project um, was focused upon understanding the expression, the stability and the functionality of this critical pH sensor. Um, and one important question um, that Shadi wanted to pursue, given the differential um, number 
of pH sensors in different fungal species was whether or not PALH was sufficient in and of itself um, to promote pH signaling and whether or not um, there was a requirement for PALH to oligomerize uh, in order to, um, to support pH signaling. <clears throat> and that hypothesis was uh, based upon the observation that the RIM21 and DFG16 proteins perform non-redundant functions in Candida and Saccharomyces species. So Shadi wanted to be able to um, express the PALH protein. She wanted to be able to detect it and follow it through her experiments, and ultimately to be able to detect the functionality of the protein and various variants uh, that she would um, construct. So um, her first experiment was a straightforward experiment to uh, address whether or not she could uh, detect the expression of, of the protein by Western blot. Uh, and she did this um, by um, introducing um, the, uh, the, the, the tet responsive allele uh, into a, a wild type genetic background. Um, and then uh, she undertook a Western blotting um, using uh, an anti-HA antibody. <clears throat> and she was able to detect a species that migrated um, at around 120, uh, a molecular weight of around 125 kilodaltons. Um, and this does not conform to the predicted molecular weight of either a monomer or a dimeric um, form uh, of PAL-H. Um, but um, because the experiment was undertaken uh, under... Um, denaturing conditions, um, it, it's perfectly possible that the size of the complex had been um, disrupted um, uh, in this experiment. And uh, so she also undertook an experiment uh, under non-denaturing um, gel electrophoresis conditions. Uh, and in this experiment, um, she was able to uh, detect the expression, um, the, the doxycycline responsive expression of a species that migrated at around um, 150 kilodaltons. Um, which would conform to the expected uh, size of a PAL-H dimer. So um, the next experiments that Shadi undertook, uh, knowing that uh, she was now able to uh, reliably detect um, uh, a form of the protein that might well be uh, an, an SDS resistant uh, dimer, she went on to uh, address the stability and functionality uh, of different truncation alleles of the pH sensor. So in this experiment, um, she constructed uh, a number of truncation alleles. Uh, you can see in the top of this figure, the full length form of the pH sensor. The transmembrane domains are indicated by these vertical lines here. Um, this is the, the black region is the uh, cytoplasmic C terminus of the pH receptor. Um, and here in the gray, this is the, uh, the amino terminus. Um, and these truncation alleles um, depleted sequentially um, various uh, transmembrane domains. Um, but importantly, uh, in, in all of these truncation alleles, the integrity of the cytoplasmic part of the protein was retained. This is the part of the protein that interacts with the arrestin uh, and is uh, fundamentally important for functionality of the protein. <clears throat> and having made these uh, alleles, Shadi then went on to have a look at the phenotype uh, of the mutants um, in the null background where the, the mutated allele is expressed in a situation where only null receptors can interact with each other. There's only one receptor that can rescue uh, the wild type phenotype. Um, however, in a wild type background, um, all of these truncation alleles are functional, presumably because they interact with another wild type receptor uh, co-expressed in the same cell. There's only one exception to that, um, uh, that rule, and that is the truncation allele uh, E, um, which is um, slightly shorter than F and lacking the uh, amino terminus of the protein. So the hypothesis here uh, is that uh, E is a truncation allele that's non-functional uh, uh, on its own, but uh, regains some function when co uh, with the wild type uh, version of the receptor. Uh, and this important result gives us uh, some functional evidence as well as biochemical evidence that the pH receptor 
functions uh, as a dimer. A further experiment that Shadi undertook to eliminate the, um, the possibility uh, that any of these truncation alleles were either unstable um, or uh, not expressed at all uh, was to detect uh, all of them um, uh, in a Western blot experiment. Um, and uh, interestingly and quite surprisingly, in fact, there was only one truncation alle allele that could not be detected uh, by Western blot um, via, this, uh, via this process. Um, and um, <clears throat> this uh, verifies that the, uh, at least the receptors are being expressed. What we can't at the moment be clear about is whether or not they're being transported to the membrane of the fungal cell. So two more ways in which we probed the importance of the uh, PAL-H um, dimerization uh, was to uh, undertake a series of experiments in living fungal cells. So the Western blot experiments uh, uh, require that the cells are fixed and killed uh, in order to uh, undertake the analysis. Um, in a, a, a yeast membrane to hybrid system, one can clone the uh, integral membrane protein um, as a uh, translational fusion uh, to a, um, a, an artificial um, reporter um, that will become cleaved by ubiquitin ligases um, if uh, a ubiquitin uh, molecule uh, is reconstituted. So um, one clones a bait uh, as a translational fusion to the C-terminus of ubiquitin um, and a prey uh, as a fusion to the N-terminus. If the ubiquitin molecule is reconstituted because those proteins come into proximity with each other, uh, the transcription factor uh, is cleaved, uh, transported to the nucleus um, and um, activates a reporter gene. Uh, in the case of the assays that we used here, um, 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 uh, it was a, a X-GAL reporter. So we were able to um, quantify the potency of interaction via a surrogate marker um, uh, by enumerating uh, the blue colonies uh, in the assay. And just to, to summarise that data, um, in the case of uh, a PAL-F prey, there was a very significant, robust interaction with the pH sensor. Um, and um, there, uh, there was also the possibility to detect uh, an interaction with a, a, a PAL-H prey uh, as well. So this is evidence from uh, an intact fungal cell that the, um, uh, the receptor is capable uh, of oligomerizing. And then finally, uh, in a final experiment that was undertaken uh, by um, Shadi, um, she uh, exploited um, the uh, parasexual cycle of Aspergillus nigellans um, to explore whether the formation of a diploid uh, isolate from two haploids that were expressing differentially epitope tagged PAL-H proteins um, could deliver evidence uh, of protein dimerization. So um, in this experiment, there are two uh, Aspergillus nigellin strains. One is expressing the PAL-H receptor with um, a MIC epitope tag, uh, and the other is expressing the receptor uh, with an, uh, an HA tag. Um, one cultures those two haploid isolates uh, together uh, under conditions conducive to forcing diploid formation. Um, and that uh, effectively uh, produces a cell that expresses um, both of these differentially tagged proteins uh, in the same fungal cell. Uh, and then uh, one simply um, immunoprecipitates uh, the proteins of interest uh, using um, beads. Uh, and then uh, detects the proteins uh, of interest uh, using uh, each of the uh, anti-epitope antibodies. Um, in, in both instances, uh, using anti-HE uh, and anti-MIC uh, antibodies, Shadi was able to detect um, um, the PAL-H receptor uh, in the diploid uh, form uh, of the fungus. Um, 
appropriately uh, according to uh, the epitope tag uh, in the haploid strain, um, it was possible to detect a positive signal, um, but it wasn't possible to pull down um, with an anti-HA body um, uh, any uh, MCTAGT protein um, uh, in the haploid cells uh, in this pull-down experiment uh, and vice versa in the bottom. So collectively, these data uh, and the toolkit that was constructed uh, in order to uh, deliver uh, our confidence in this receptor as a target for drug discovery um, provide us with a basis now for attempting to identify compounds that will inhibit the pH signaling pathway. Um, and these are some uh, alpha fold uh, predictions uh, and some predictions on the location uh, of potential ligand binding sites uh, in the pH receptor um, that largely map to uh, two sites uh, with relatively uh, high confidence. Uh, and our hope, of course, in our uh, drug screening experiments is that we'll be able to identify molecules that uh, will target um, this pH receptor. So uh, in order to do this, um, and this is work by Bethany McCann in my lab, um, a genetic screen was devised that would be able to detect inhibitors of PAXI signaling. Um, now, in order to do this, um, Bethany uh, exploited the fact that uh, in order for uh, aspergillus um, species to utilize a gamma aminobutyric acid as a nitrogen source, um, the, uh, the, the PAXI signaling uh, pathway needs to be switched off. So uh, actually um, what one is able to do is to build a genetic screen whereby the fungus will only grow if the pH signaling pathway uh, is inhibited. So one constructs a, a, a reporter isolate that is fundamentally dependent upon uh, GABA import for growth, uh, and then uses that as the reporter isolate uh, to screen a collection uh, of uh, inhibitors. Uh, and Bethany was able to um, undertake this screen uh, using a collection of chemical fragments, uh, the Maybridge Chemical Fragment Library, um, and um, in her pilot experiments, she was able to show that the uh, the assay works. So this is a, a comparison of a, a pH non-signaling and pH signaling strain. Um, and these are uh, optical density measurements of the fungus over time. Uh, and so what we can see in this assay is that the pH non-signaling mutant is growing whilst the, the pH um, signaling strain uh, is not. So using this approach, um, Bethany has been able to screen a large number uh, of chemical entities. Um, over 500 uh, individual chemical fragments, but also now uh, a library of more than 5,000 FDA approved drugs. Um, and this has yielded uh, a, a collection of chemicals that appear to specifically inhibit the pH signaling pathway. Um, we do have some cross checks uh, on these molecules to make sure that they are on target in terms of their mode of action. So uh, in this figure, this is simply uh, a recapitulation of the GABA uptake data. Um, so this is recapitulating the outputs of a screen. Um, and in this particular experiment, um, this is the, um, the growth promotion uh, on GABA as sole nutrient uh, source for a pallet null mutant, which grows as we would expect, um, and, um, but not for a mutant where the uh, transcription factor is constitutively activated. Uh, and here are two examples uh, of compounds that were pulled from the initial pilot screen. Um, which uh, phenocopy uh, the uh, pH sensor null mutant. Uh, and then uh, on the right hand side, um, an independent uh, assay of the effect of those two chemicals on the ability of the fungus to grow at pH 8. Um, and um, this is uh, an independent verification that um, the inhibitors are, are, are hitting the pH signaling pathway. And then finally, um, 
Bethany constructed a, a genetic means of determining on target um, mode of action. Um, and this was achieved by constructing a reporter isolate, um, which um, uh, mimics the uh, promoter of the uh, of an important sodium transporter in the fungal cell, uh, which is heavily regulated pa uh, by Paxi. Um, uh, the gene is called uh, ENA1, and the gene promoter has um, more than uh, nine uh, Paxi consensus binding sites. Um, Upon alkaline exposure, this gene is expressed within uh, five minutes in a pH dependent fashion. Bethany hooked that gene promoter up to a yellow fluorescent protein uh, and uh, used that as a readout uh, of activity uh, for uh, the, um, um, the molecules of interest. Uh, and so again, uh, in this screen, um, relative to um, the fluorescence of a Paxi null mutant, um, you can see that uh, these two molecules of uh, interest um, seem to um, diminish a uh, signal from that yellow fluorescent protein reporter. So this work uh, has led to the identification of a series, uh, five, five series, a chemical series of compounds. Um, on uh, the left hand side, uh, in each case, um, the uh, an, a, initial um, founder um, of the series, uh, and on the right, a collection uh, of molecules that uh, share similar structures uh, and also similar activities. Um, and so now we're in a space with this work uh, where we can use the toolkit that we have built to uh, deliver functional readouts of uh, pH sensing, uh, along with um, this collection of molecules to try to decipher uh, what the actual target uh, of these compounds uh, is. Um, and then to conclude, um, I just wanted to highlight that the work that, that I've shared with you today um, has focused upon um, a single transcription factor in a pathogenic fungus. Um, but the Aspergillus fumigatus genome encodes more than 380 uh, similar gene products in a collaboration with Mike Bromley at the University of Manchester, uh, in work led by Norman Rand Ryan and Takanori Furukawa, uh, we were able to test um, in mouse models of disease, uh, the fitness of the entire cohort of transcription factor null mutants. Um, and this identified a cohort of uh, more than 45 transcriptional regulators that are fundamentally important for fitness in a mammalian host. So the PAC-C transcription factor sits in this a collection uh, of blue um, uh, mutants here, um, which are deficient in fitness uh, in two murine models of disease. Um, the take home message from this data is that there, there, are, there is a wealth uh, of work to be done uh, in the space of identifying uh, important inhibitors uh, of transcription. Uh, and perhaps some of the approaches that we've been able to take with the pH sensing machinery um, we'll give other people uh, some ideas about how they can approach that work uh, with some of these other transcription factors. Um, and that, that work uh, will um, be submitted soon um, and hopefully published this year. Just to say that the vast majority of those transcription factors are important for regulating uh, uh, adaptation to stress in the host environment. So in vitro screens uh, of phenotypes for these mutants, based on uh, a number of different infection related stresses, identified that more than 72% of all of the transcription factor mutants that fall into these uh, orange and blue clusters in the data set um, are captured in, in these stress response data. So um, we have uh, transcription factors that are important for adapting to high pH, to hypoxic environments, to alkaline pH, um, uh, low zinc uh, at the top here, uh, and various other stresses. So uh, this analysis marks out uh, a stress adaptation network, uh, if you like, a regulatory network for Aspergillus fumigatus, um, which likely defines um, a major um, component of its ability to colonize uh, the human host. With that, um, I'd like to uh, wrap up. 
Um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge um, the work of uh, collaborators um, at Imperial College in London, um, at the University of Manchester and at the University of Exeter. Um, and thank everybody uh, for joining the call uh, this evening uh, and listening to the talk. Thank you, Elaine. That was absolutely beautiful. Um, I don't know if you want to maybe stop sharing your screen now while we um, mm. take some questions. So can I just remind people who are on the call, if you have any questions, if you put them in the chat, then that will be great. And can I just say, Elaine, that it is absolutely inspirational how you have showcased how you take your basic understanding of the pathobiology of this important fungal pathogen to then translate that into finding potentially novel antifungal agents that can actually inhibit the virulence of this pathogen. That that really, I think, showcases how important it is that we understand the biology of these, of these uh, fungal pathogens. So thank you very much for that. So there are some questions in the chat, so I will um, I will start to go through these. So, so Christian Taylor has some questions um, regarding the cell biology of Aspergillus fumigatus. He has asked, can pathogenic mold mycelia produce spores within the lungs and so potentially cause transmission through coughing? So a transmission question there for you, Elaine. Yeah, um, the answer is yes. Um, and in the images that, that I showed, uh, which actually are, are quite typical of the sorts of growth that we see in highly immunocompromised um, mice, um, you, you really only saw the, the hyphal uh, vegetative forms of the fungus. But um, in clinical samples, particular uh, clinical uh, syndromes, um, I think in the setting of influenza uh, in particular and in certain organ transplant settings, there is a, a manifestation of disease uh, called tracheobronchitis, where um, one can see the fungus growing into the tissue, but also forming this, um, um, at, at, you know, at the surface of the tissue, um, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the uh, sporulating um, form of the fungus. Um, so, yes, it can be observed. Um, can this lead to transmission? A very interesting, uh, important, timely question, given the, um, the problems that we're seeing with azole resistance. Um, there's a large study ongoing around that, led by Matt Fisher, um, Matt Fisher and Darius Armstrong James in London uh, and Mike Bromley in Manchester, who um, are collectively uh, investigating um, the uh, the transmission routes uh, of uh, azole resistance in Aspergillus species. So I will say watch that space. Um, but uh, yes, um, it is possible for um, the sporulating form of the fungus to grow inside the human lung. It's very, very... Uh very interesting we will be watching that space there's a further question regarding um cell biology of aspergillus and this is regarding the ballooning that you described so the ballooning hyphae that you saw in your mutant strains so the question is do you think that these this ballooning is due to the process of these strains producing yeast-like forms hmm. <laughs> um that's uh that it, that's an interesting um question um it, that's that that's not what's happening um with uh, aspergillus fumigatus because of uh, the uh well as we understand it um the developmental life cycle of fumigatus is from a spore to a hypha um actually if you observe these uh, ballooning activities um in live cells uh, using confocal uh, assisted microfluidics uh, type approaches, um, um, what, what you will see is actually those uh, hyphae lies um, and um, some of them are dead and some of them recover, um, but uh, it, it, it seems to be um, more uh, the uh, activity of the antifungal drug uh, at the growing hyphal tip. Interestingly, um, uh, with yeast 
with yeasts with candida hyphae, um, there is a, a, a sort of a, a mass conversion, if you like, to uh, yeasts and isotropic growth. Um, so, um, yeah, it's an interesting question, but that's not what's happening in Aspergillus fumigators. Yeah. yeah, no, thank you very much, Billy. So then Christian asks you a pH related question. Um, so he's framing this by saying that many woodland acidiomyces seem to prefer alkali conditions and don't seem to grow well in acidic pH conditions. It seems that Aspergillus species molds may be the opposite and being more naturally attuned to low pH and having to work harder to adapt to higher pH. So does this suggest a different mechanism of pH sensing than other groups of fungi? Or do you think that the pH sensing mechanism genes, which you have studies, are highly conserved, but perhaps used in different ways by different groups? That's a very, um, very, very good question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the signaling mechanism is very highly conserved. Um, and what's important um, to convey at this point is the the duality of that system so um at the beginning of the talk i mentioned that the the regulatory control um you know um it, it, it can be quite promoter specific in terms of whether or not genes are up or down regulated uh uh in response to um particular um ph signals so it's entirely feasible that the uh, the regulon of the transcription factor um, has uh, evolved. Um, it's also entirely feasible that the fine tuning of the system has evolved. There, there are many many um, points in the mechanism where there is is scope for that to happen. You know, even at the level of uh, post translational modification of particular signaling components and the rates at which that happens. Um, but it, it's certainly also the case um, that this uh, genetic mechanism is, is not the only um, essential component required for um, pH tolerant growth, uh, at, you know, at either end of the pH scale. Um, and a further point, very important point, uh, and an area that we're very interested in at the moment, um, is that um, from an evolutionary perspective, it's unlikely that dependency uh, of, you know, uh, such an important mechanism upon a single transcription factor um, is uh, the only safeguard um, that, that evolution has put in place. Um, so, um, yeah, that's that's a, 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 an interesting point that we're working on uh, to figure out um, how a single transcription factor can actually achieve regulation of so many uh, gene gene products. Oh, thank you very much, Elaine. There's a question um, from Shona Duggan here, and she starts with some compliments. She says, I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. She agrees with me that, um, that it's inspirational to see the journey of understanding the pH sensing and aspergillus leading to therapeutic targets. And she asks, she says, thinking back to the ability of the PAC-C mutant to cause epithelial detachment, she was taken by the absence of a difference between mutant cells and supernatants. So have you looked at the secretome of your mutants? Could the secretion systems affected by disruption, um, could the secretion systems affected by disruption uh, impact to pH signaling? No, I need to make sure I've understood the question um, correctly. So, um, rephrase. That. Can you? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. So she's very much taken by the um, the difference. Um, whether the epithelial detachment is this looking at the secretome of the mutants between your wild type and your Paxi mutants. So, is there some difference in the secretome that's that's driving that um, the um, detachment phenotype? To the secretion, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, I haven't been watching the chat myself. Um, yes, uh, I believe the answer is yes, <laughs> and I so believe Shun's we have some back. evidence to support that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so Sean has come back and said, "Is the secretion system? Um, could the secretion <clears throat> system be affected by disruption to pH signaling?" 
yeah yeah so um yes uh yes it can um and um interestingly um it, it, so we, we've got this cohort of um gene products that are under PAXI regulatory control um a number of these are uh, important components uh of the secretory system um not not components that um serve non-redundant functions um, but components where um, there is some uh, redundancy, um, but uh, where nonetheless there could be uh, an, an impact on, on secretion. Um, there are some um, similarities um, in terms of the transcriptome signal, uh, the transcriptional signature um, between a Paxi null mutant and a mutant that is uh, deficient um, in, in secretion. So there, there are some overlapping um, processes there for sure. Um, and for me, this makes sense from a cell biological perspective. If you think about the traffic, for want of a better word, the volume, uh, mm. of traffic through the secretory system that yeah. potentially is under PAXI control. Yeah. Um, and then uh, on another level to uh, address that um, that that question, and this is aside from the secretory system itself, and we have done some work on the secretome um, and um, identified various components that, that, that are up or down regulated in the PAXI null mutant. Um, it will be interesting to compare that data to uh, some of the secretome mutant data to see uh, exactly how much of this um, transcriptional control is directly linked to the ability to transport the gene product. That uh, is a, a, a unanswered question um, in the field. Absolutely. So Paul Dyer asks, is anything known about what genes Paxi switches on to a low pH response and survival? Are any of these target genes fungal specific and so potential therapy candidates? Although he's noting you already have plenty. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> um, yeah, so um, it's so it's likely, uh, I mean, transcription factors alone, before you even begin to think about the, um, you know, just, just functional uh, genes, but transcriptional um, factors alone, um, th there's clearly uh, some hierarchy uh, involved in terms of uh, the ways in which those will uh, function together and uh, collectively under, you know, completely uh, different um scenarios that, that that that's a, a piece of work in and of itself but an example might be um the uh, the way in which paxi um collaborates with uh, transcription factors that facilitate the uptake of zinc which is a essential um nutrient in the fungal cell um that's one example um of course what we're looking for with our secreted factors um are uh, dominant effectors of pathogenicity um that could be important um from a, um, the perspective uh, of um, developing novel vaccines. That's great. Right, if I, if I may, um, there's no further questions in the chat, so I may ask um, a question. So, so you have been able to exploit your understanding of pH signaling biology to lead to these potentially new therapies. Can you flip this around? So what I'm wondering, so for example, can you can you model the docking of these potential targets onto your onto PAL H to give you some insight into the key regions of that receptor that are responsible for the pH signal? Because I forgive me if I'm wrong, but do you actually know the mechanism by which pal -H is able to sense and respond to that change in pH? Yeah, so um, the, it's a great question. Um, and potentially these molecules could reveal uh, some answers uh, to that question. Um, we we do not know. Um, I, I couldn't go into it, but um, the, the, there are certainly some insights around the lipid com, uh, composition of okay. the plasma membrane of the fungal cell. Um, and actually, interestingly, 
Um, it's the lipid composition at the internal leaflet, not the external leaflet that seems to be important. So the cytoplasmic portion of the pH sensor um, interacts with the inner leaflet of the plasma yeah. membrane. Um, and if you if you meddle with the uh, phosphatidyl serine composition in the inner leaflet, that can uh, elicit uh, the pH signal. So there are some clues there, potentially, um, mm -hmm. uh, maybe unexpectedly, about the existence of a perhaps mm -hmm. a, a lipid ligand that derives yeah. from inside, not outside the cell. Impossible to know at this point in time. But, um, you know, um, uh, also, of course, there they could be multiple ligands that are able to uh, activate um, or inactivate uh, the switch. Very exciting mm -hmm. because um, that, that would allow us to target the mechanism in different contexts uh, according to the, the type of uh, drug that could be used. So, um, you know, you, you might imagine if the, the molecules are not going to be useful from an, uh, you know, clinical perspective, they may well be useful um, in terms of um, some some other control phenomenon um, that, that may be some of our, um, you know, our members who, who don't work in the, the clinical space um, would be interested, uh, you know, to um, to discuss. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, for one, will be watching this amazing story unfold um, with great interest. So if there are no further questions. Um, I just want to finish by thanking you again, Elaine, for an absolutely inspirational talk, sharing your research with us. I'd like to thank all of the audience um, for giving up your precious evening and coming along and hearing about some great mycological science. This is what the BMS are all about. This is what we want to do. We want to promote mycological science wherever we can. So I really hope you've enjoyed it. So I think with that, I can say goodbye and um, hope you all have a very pleasant rest of the evening. And thanks again. Bye.